Well, I guess I'm trying to say is that the, uh, the kind of drift of history, so to speak, of the force, the karmic force of our situation of civilization seems to be pushing us towards some kind of impending massive disaster. And you and the other people involved in this action are a few in number. But what I'm trying to say, do you think that there are, that the action that you take it, symbolic and as real as it is, has any potentiality for waking up enough people soon enough to head off what seems to be so impending? And, I, and I'm seeing that in terms of the, the kind of apocalyptic vision that you talk mm -hmm. about in the Bible and other sources of prophecy, like the book of the Hopi, mm -hmm. who say that we're coming near the end. Yeah. Um, I think it still comes down to a human choice. I think uh, it was human choice that brought us here. And it's human choice that's going to turn it around if that happens, if it can happen. And uh, I think that's where the question of one's own responsibility comes in, you know, and one's own set of choices. Uh, either you drift along and on the tide of history and let it all happen, or you do what you can to change it. And uh, quite frequently, it's been a few people that have changed history. It's, you know, it's, you, you can look back and see uh, that is the case, you know. I, I know Ramsey's referred several times to William Lloyd Garrison and the Grimke sisters in abolition and how even up to and beyond the time of emancipation, they were still thought of as nuts. And they were still, you know, a tiny minority in, in many respects. But, uh, you know, we can look back now and say, yeah, a few people did have some impact. You know, I don't know if it's us, but I, I still see that as a possible process. Sort of what the prophet Micah said, that in the last days they shall turn their swords, swords into plowshares. I thought that, that's an interesting qualification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not until the last days. The last days, yeah. And then the they is an interesting pronoun, too. Mm-hmm. They as we, I hope. All of us. <laughs> Beautiful <laughs> ideas. <laughs> well, some kind of enlightened potentiality in terms of meaning, which is something that, well, unfortunately, is pretty rare, actually. I mean, it's as rare as your action. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. The media sucked in, you know. Well, I don't like to lay a number on the judge. Um, probably as an aptitude, it's given us as many opportunities and, and has made visible, you know, some of the insanities of the courtroom situation. It's widespread, not simply taking place in his courtroom. So I don't want to lay a heavy trip on Samuel Salas. Uh, I think he is not all that different, except he's a little more inept than any court in the nation. You know, there just aren't courts that want to listen to these questions, which are very valid questions to be raised legally. Well, I was going to ask you about that. You had a brief that you presented that was not discussed in open court, citing right. some laws, some, statu some statutes that really provided explicitly for the kind of action that you did. And one of the things I noticed in that brief was the statement that this is not a novel argument. I'm sure you know more about those laws, having spoken with the attorneys at some length about it. You might like to explain. Well, there, particularly the Pennsylvania statutes on justification, which make clear that one can, and indeed may in instances be obligated. There's another law that about failure to prevent a catastrophe, I think, which I think is in that brief. That, so that it's clear that one may be obligated, or at least one is free from criminal uh, being called a criminal, being treated as a criminal, if you break a law in order to prevent a far greater danger. And I think we were making a very good case for justification uh, in terms of the nuclear arms threat. And that, that was analogous to the example the judge used of, of the person breaking into a house to save human lives in, in the case of a fire or a possibly explosive situation. 
and uh, you know we were just saying just you know open the scale of that to include mass genocide and then you can get some point at some point the sense of what we're talking about you know that's what we're all about trying to prevent and uh, I don't know what the jurors are doing with that right now it sounds like they're quibbling over <laughs> surreptitious and, and subterfuge so it doesn't sound like they've gotten the point of that Unfortunately, because we didn't get to argue the brief and because we didn't get to really put that argument seriously before the court. We suggested it in court, but we didn't get to, um, you know, put it forward in, in a, uh, a very specific fashion that, that clearly laid out uh, and, and logically carried the argument through. So I'm sure the jurors hearing that and then hearing the charge of the judge, you know, are feeling at this point, even if they would like to let us go, limited by the law. Uh, I think there's another point, too, that that uh, jurors are never charged with, and that is the fact that they have consciences, and that no judge can uh, exact a penalty against a jury for finding people not guilty, even if they don't apply the law as he sets it out, that they have a right as jurors to follow their consciences. And I think that's a basic precept that, you know, goes back in history as far as John Adams in this country and William Penn, who, you know, is a very important local figure uh, in the history of William Penn. There was a, um, he was put on trial for, I think, sedition. Well, for, for meeting with co-religionists, which uh -huh. is against the law, and I suppose it was sedition. Yeah, and his, uh, the jury found him not guilty, and they were put in jail at that point. You know, that, at this point, and they knew you know, they would be put in jail. They knew they would be put in jail, and they went ahead and found him not guilty. So that's certainly a clear example of, of the fact that there is a right to, to do that. And and today, it's it's in case law that they're they would you know the jurors across the street could find us not guilty and they certainly wouldn't be put in jail and they certainly could be acting as conscience and I suggested they needed to be acting not only as community conscience but conscience of the nation I was going to say that it seems to me that the uh, the strategies that you undertook somewhat sabotaged your own potentiality as far as being acquitted goes I'm not saying that it wasn't the right thing to do but particularly in terms of the four defendants who went out to GE. And it, rather than making statements and testifying and attempting to convince the jury of some kind of justification, although it was going to well, be difficult. What happened with Elmer Moss was that he tried to get to the factual basis for our justification argument, and every time he brought it up, he was cut off. Um, I think the turning point, the key decision, was the decisions of the judge not to let the expert testimony in, which would give a reasonable basis, you know, by experts uh, for our intent, for our, our ideas that uh, weren't simply our own kind of ideas that came out of the sky and out of the clouds, but that there were, you know, very strong uh, logical arguments to put us in the frame of mind, to give us the intent uh, that we what we were doing was in fact uh, justifiable. Uh, he just cut the bottom out of that, and then he limited the testimony of uh, of Elmer Moss, the second person that was uh, testifying in his own defense, so that um, all he was going to let in was was opinionated in things. How did you get to this opinion? And then as soon as you'd say, "Well, I read this particular thing," he wouldn't allow. Uh, him to go on and say what it was that he read in Dr. Falk and the various experts he cited. So it became farcical at that point. Um, I just particularly didn't felt that I didn't want to go into that courtroom and give credence to that whole uh, scene and say, yes, this is somehow we're going to plod through and convince a jury, maybe a one in a thousand chance that we would convince a jury based on the very little information they've been given and the fact that we've been, you know, cut off at every point. To give credence to that as a judicial process that it, that was something that we should go along with, I think at that point, uh, was not to tell the truth. 
So, you be, uh, so the decision, I assume, was a group decision that you wanted to cut through the kind of absurdity of the court itself and to demonstrate by your action, uh, by refusing to participate any further, that that was a statement, that that was your statement of truth at sure. that moment. I think Phil put it, I don't remember the exact quote, but he stood up and said, well, this court is just, uh, you know, giving a legal basis for the arms race. That's what every court in the country does. Well, not everyone to. has, since there, since there have been other instances in which the kind of statutes <coughs> arguing justification have been invoked. Mm -hmm. A few, only. There's some uh, legal precedent, but I don't think um, many courts take the international law and the Nuremberg principles seriously. And, uh, it really takes some you know, it's it's a very difficult case to argue in these courts, and and yet the the irony is that it was this country that played the leading rule role in setting forth those principles for Germans. All we're asking is that the same kind of uh, reasoning that went into the Nuremberg principles be applied in our own case. Well, so many seem to judge others and judge themselves. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Thanks.